Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu, and this is the November 2022 episode of Amplify. Today, I'm excited to share with you that we have Dr. Amy Shaw and Dr. Rusty Walker to talk to us about pediatric ocular trauma. It's a terrifying topic. I can't think of anything worse than a child with an eye injury, especially something like a globe rupture or a reptorobulbar hematoma. We cover all of these things and more, everything on the spectrum of ocular trauma in children in today's episode. It is jam-packed, and it is based on the article that both Dr. Shaw and Dr. Walker authored for the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice Journal in September of this year. And while we're on the topic of the journals, it has never been a better time to subscribe at ebmedicine.net than right now. For the rest of this month, that's right, for the entire month of November, you can save 20% on any subscription where you spend $300 or more. That's emergency medicine practice, pediatric emergency medicine practice, or evidence-based urgent care medicine, or all three if you want access to all three. Each come with four hours of CME credit every single month in every single issue, along with clinical pathways, points and pearls, risk management pitfalls. I mean, there's just a ton of information there. And of course, it's all available to you in the mobile app, on your mobile device, at the point of care, on and on and on, and it's all 20% off. It's a perfect time to subscribe. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Shaw and Dr. Walker. Let's talk pediatric eye injuries. Hello, everybody. I'm um, Amisha. I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician at UMC Children's Hospital of Nevada and currently the program director of PEM Fellowship as well. And I'm, I'm Rusty Walker. I'm one of the um, PEM Fellows in Dr. Shaw's fellowship program in Las Vegas in my third year. Fantastic. Thank you both for joining us. You two authored the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice article on pediatric ocular trauma, which is what we're here to discuss today. A very anxiety-provoking set of patients and injuries for sure. So I was very happy to see this topic pop up for our Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice series Before we begin, does one of you have a personal interest in eyes and eye injuries, or why did you pick this topic? Well, I I think that um, just like you said, it's anxiety provoking, and it kind of produces this visceral reaction in most people when you think about ocular trauma, and that's what drew me towards it. It's something uncomfortable for me, and I wanted to be more of an expert in it, and it's, I think, something that we all should be a little more comfortable with. And I, I hope this article provides that that level of comfort. Fantastic. When we're talking about ocular injuries and ocular trauma, especially in children, what kinds of injuries are common? Is there a particular age group that has specific kinds of eye injuries that are more common? What does the data out there tell us? So really, all the pediatric injuries are dependent on the age. It's mostly because of the developmental stage of the child, starting at younger age group, mostly like neonates and that age group, they can get a lot of corneal aberrations by accidentally scratching their cornea with their own nails if they're not clipped and things like that. Obviously, as you expand and the child gets more creative, the toddlers get into everything and they can accidentally poke themselves in their eyes or fall and cause some injuries. And then as you advance in the school age, then you get more and more of sports-related injuries and teenagers really a lot more of either sports-related or work occupational hazards. Also, you start seeing once they start getting employed. So there's a wide variety of ocular trauma based on the developmental stage of the child. Great. So that's a lot of different things we're going to cover today. It really is a very thorough review. Part of that is just knowing the anatomy. And if you have access to the article, there is a great figure, figure one on the third page of the article that just reviews some of the anatomy of the eye, as well as some of the anatomical classifications of trauma 
to the eye. There are some things that are sort of around the eye and things that involve the eye itself. How does that break down when we talk about some of the anatomical regions? So writing this article, or even when I think of it in my day-to-day clinical practice, in the ER, most of us think algorithms and have a systematic approach, because unless you have that, you're going to miss something. What we recommend doing in terms of your eye exam is go from outside inwards. So you want to first visualize the eyebrows, the eyelid, compare it to the other eye if there is only like a unilateral ocular injury. The comparison of the two sides also gives you a lot of information about what could be going on. So have an outside-in approach. We have table one that gives you that approach in some ways. So you start with eyebrows, eyelids, orbital bones, then you do your conjunctiva and the globe. The globe itself, again, you should have a systematic approach as to like cornea, iris, pupils, anterior chamber, clara, posterior chamber. And if you have this anatomy in your mind and you are doing your exam accordingly, you are going to cover most of the bases. I think it's also important to uh, keep in mind that there's, again, that visceral response that people have to eye injuries and they get a little bit scared and focused on the eye. It's important to look for other injuries that might be surrounding the eye as well. Intracranial injuries, other facial injuries, or even non-accidental trauma should be in consideration with any of these kids. Good. Yeah, that's a good point. So considering things that are not just globe related, but the circumstances in which they occurred is very important. That's an excellent point. There is a figure, uh, figure three, the globe injury zones. Now, for those unfamiliar, tell me a little bit more about those zones and why that becomes important in our discussion, perhaps with our ophthalmology colleagues. Yes, so you're absolutely right. I mean, this is more in terms of your communication with the consultant. I think from an ER perspective, it may not be that clinically relevant, but in order to classify them into urgent versus emergent, or if you want to get the ophthalmologist stat in the ER on board, if you speak his language, it might be better communicated than if we are speaking different languages. I think that's where the globe injury zones become really, really important. So zone one is just limited injury to the cornea, maybe depending on the type of injury that can be followed up on an urgent basis within 24 hours or something like that. The further posterior you go, especially zone two and zone three, you should have discussion with the ophthalmologist. Hopefully, they'll just come emergently and do their assessment in the ED, depending on the case. But those are the injuries where I would err on the side of caution and avoid like a 24-hour follow-up, rather have them come in the ER, again, depending on the case. Good. Many of our listeners may be in areas where the ophthalmologist isn't even available and they're contemplating transferring a patient out to somewhere that has ophthalmology available. So the further back we go away from zone one, which is just the cornea, the higher the likelihood you're going to have to get that patient somewhere with ophthalmology available. Yes, I would agree with that. And again, this is related to ocular trauma. So This may not be true for other medical ocular urgencies or emergencies, but especially with trauma, because here we are thinking of lacerations and penetrating wounds to be a little bit more specific. And yes, if you have a limbus involvement or a posterior globe involvement, really, even if you have corneal laceration, you should be transferring them urgently. So that's where this becomes handy. And speaking about those kinds of injuries, when we are thinking about the differential diagnosis for ocular trauma, there is a giant list there in table three of all of the different types of traumatic injuries that can occur to the eye. It's really quite a thorough review of all of the injuries that we should be considering when we're talking about someone with ocular trauma. So again, if you've got access to the article, that's table three on page four. Most of our approach when we're talking about any kind of disease process is taken from outside the emergency department and then flowing through the department. So for our pre-hospital colleagues that may be listening, 
what are some of the ways that EMS can help us or help the patient, depending on the injury? What kinds of things should they be looking for pre-hospital when they're transporting the patient? I think it goes without saying with any of these eye injuries, the first thing should be try to keep the patient comfortable, calm, and try not to cause any additional injury. The mainstay for many of these eye injuries in the past has been to put a, an eye patch over there. And that's fine. You just want to make sure that you don't put any extra pressure on it. Because if there is an open globe, which might not be readily apparent, you don't want to be leaking out extra vitreous fluid. With any eye injury, it's a safe bet to keep the patient sitting upward, elevate the head of the bed, don't have them laying flat because that increases in intracranial pressure or intraocular pressure. You want to keep them from vomiting as best you can. So Zofran's appropriate or other antiemetics. I think that if you're in a pinch and it looks like there might be an open globe and you want to put some sort of cover over the eye, which is appropriate, and you feel like the normal eye shield that you have in your rig or, or wherever else you're working might put pressure, uh, a styrofoam cup's a great way to cover the eye without adding any additional pressure. Again, controlling the pain, if it's like a younger kid and you can't get them to calm down and you feel like examining them more or um, putting an IV in is going to cause them additional stress and get them aggravated, well, crying, vomiting, whatever else, you might just want to back off. Just kind of let them be comfortable, let their parents hold them if they can and get them to the emergency department where we can do other things such as intranasal medications, oral medications, and we have sedation and other things more readily available. It's, I, I think that the most important thing for any pre-hospital provider is going to be try and get them directly to a trauma center. If you suspect serious ocular trauma, you don't necessarily need to go to the closest hospital. It's better to get them somewhere where they can get an ophthalmologist to them quickly. Good. Yeah. Sometimes that can be difficult to determine unless they have an obvious foreign body or a pencil sticking out of their globe or something of that sort. <laughs> if it's a chemical exposure or if it was some debris or something that entered the eye, it can be a little bit more of a challenge to figure out. But I do like the idea of keeping the patient calm, maybe reducing the number of procedures you have to perform on the patient en route if it's not absolutely necessary. And when you talked about the styrofoam cup, for those who are unfamiliar, you mean just taking a, a regular styrofoam coffee cup and covering the orbit and then just taping it in place and it yep. just basically shields the eye? Yeah, you can either trim it or you can place the entire cup over and just you'll need more tape, obviously, to, to, to put it on. But one of the nice things about that is you can put the tape over so that it's not putting any pressure over any of the, the orbit itself, but it, it does require a bit of finagling. Excellent. And then when the patient makes it to the emergency department and we're trying to get a history from them or the parent in this case, what are some of the important things we need to know? So if we look at the table four, it gives a good overview in the busy ED if you want to just take a quick peek at that and get through your checklist. Again, just remember this being pediatrics, you want to remember the developmental milestone of the child. So that should be on your background while you are taking more and more of the history. Of course, with any trauma, like you want to know the exact mechanism now with the smartphones and videos, if you have a video of how thing, things happen, looking at it and watching it is, gives you a lot of information. If there is a foreign body or a chemical exposure, knowing the exact detail of what that substance is will definitely be helpful, especially with foreign bodies. If it's like a curved object versus like a small object, straight object will determine the further management. If they have glasses or anything on a baseline, if they wear contact lenses, those are some of the other important areas of history that you want to remember. Again, depending on what you see, you also want to know the underlying medical history, if they are on any blood thinners, do they have any hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell trait is, this is one of the areas where not just sickle cell disease, but sickle cell trait is an important history that you need to know as well. And if it is an occupational hazard, I would say like if they were using any eye protection or not, 
that would be important because then you have to bake in that for your assessment as well. Good. If, if, if I might offer a, an anecdote, just two weeks ago, I had a patient who said he was working on a car and a ball bearing hit him in the eye. I looked at his eye and didn't see anything, but this illustrates how important the history is. I, I asked him in more detail what exactly was going on. Turns out he was grinding a ball bearing with, a, with an angle grinder and a piece of the angle grinder had hit his eye. And far beneath the eyelid, I was able to see that there was a, a perforating injury of the eye. And on CT, there was a, a, a metal foreign body in his eye. So just make sure to, to suss out exactly what might have caused this, what speed things were going, whatever else. Yeah. I know we're talking about pediatrics, but this is a, a pretty broad age group and everything from high schoolers who might be in shop and dealing with some power tools all the way down to the neonate. This is a very broad range of potential injuries. So that's another good point. When it comes time for the physical examination, what kinds of things should we have available to us and what kind of things should be part of that exam? So I will reiterate, have a systematic approach outside in or whatever you decide, but outside in is what's mostly recommended. Now, tools, it is a good idea for an ER to just come up with a checklist of things that you need for a good ocular exam. This is particular in case of pediatrics. If you want to start with the eye exam, obviously visual acuity is the vital sign of the eye. So as you do vital signs for everything else, heart rate, blood pressure, Visual acuity is the vital sign of the eye, and it is extremely important to document. Again, the visual acuity screening changes by age. That makes it more challenging based on the developmental milestone of the child. If you look at Table 5, it gives you a brief overview based on the developmental milestone as to what to expect from a child. So younger than three years, as long as they can fix and follow is good enough. You really don't need to do chart assessment. That's not possible at that age. For three to five years, what is approved by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the World Health Organization is LSM balls and HOTV charts. And then for more than six years, so mostly school-age children who have a little bit more literacy, is Sloan's letters. So make sure your ED has those tools. Like before we did the article, we had Snellen's chart in our ED, which is pretty standard, but it's not recommended. <laughs> they do validation studies based on the age and the diopters. It's a complex system that the ophthalmologists follow. And then we all were having the children look at Snellen's charts, but that's not what they recommend as the standard of care for the pediatric age group. So make sure you have the right tools uh, box for visual acuity screening. Um, in terms of the other tool, you will require at least a light, like a pen light to do a light reflex and things like that. You will require a Q-tip to sort of evert the eyelid. That is an important part of the exam. You will also require a pinhole, it's a simple tool in case people have corrective lenses and they their glasses broke and you cannot do visual acuity. You can try with a pinhole and get some assessment of their visual acuity while you are doing that. Then there are more adjuncts like tetracaine eye drops and fluorescein, but we'll go into that later. So that's a really good point about visual acuity. There's a, a good picture in the article about what those two different charts look like and what they should look like for our pediatric population. When it comes to visual acuity, are we expecting it to be the same across the entire age group? Is it 2020 all the way, or are there different standards based on age? So there are different standards based on age. So once they are six years and above, we are expecting 2020, but then visual acuity again is very, very specific. So the numerator is the distance of the testing and the recommended distance is 10 or 20 feet. So when we say 2020, the first like normal documentation is, okay, normal visual acuity is 2020. 
But even if you say 10, 20, that means that you, you had the patient standing 10 feet away versus 20 feet away. So the way we have it in our ED is we have marked a 20 feet spot from where our chart is, like the, we just drew like a little line. So we know that this is a 20 feet distance and this is the distance from where we are doing the visual acuity. So that's the numerator. And that's very important because you can't be like five feet away and documenting the visual acuity. That's a completely wrong assessment. And it will give very different information to the, our ophthal colleagues when we are communicating with them. And the denominator is the last line where the patient identifies at least half of the letters correctly. It doesn't have to be all. It has to be 50% correct response. So that's something to keep in mind. So newborn's visual acuity, as we all know, is obviously they can just look at the mother's face. So it's like 2,400. Really, you really don't need visual acuity in a newborn to that depth. But it gets to an adult level at around six years of age where it is like completely 2020. But I don't think you, from an ED, practical ED perspective, as long as you're doing it correctly and talking to your ophthal colleagues in the right manner, they should be able to like go into fine tune it based on age and things like that. So a couple things for visual acuity. It has to be monoocular visual acuity. So I feel like I'm not sure how many parts of this exam I did correctly before, but writing the article helped me fine tune my assessment as well. So you need to cover one eye and whatever we document is a monoocular documentation. You cannot have binocular documentation of that. And then also remember if they are wearing corrective lenses, if they have glasses or something like that, then know their baseline and you test it with their correction. You are not trying to test it without their correction. This can get challenging, but those are two other points to remember from a practical perspective. Good. Yeah, so each eye, and if they wear glasses, then make sure they're wearing their glasses if possible. Yeah, and then distance and 50% correct recognition. So I think if you have these four parameters in your toolbox, in your mind, then you should get it mostly right. Good. I feel like 99% of the EDs in the country are doing this wrong. Why <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> are doing it? <laughs> okay, so then we move on. We've done the visual acuity and we're getting ready to start the rest of our physical examination of the eye. What kinds of things are we moving on to here? I think that the next steps in terms of diagnostics are really kind of part of your physical exam, or at least they should be. First being the, the fluorescein staining. Fluorescein is available in pretty much every emergency department. Mostly these days we have the sterile fluorescein strips rather than the solution because there were some concerns about bacterial contamination in the solution. So now the strips are available. And traditionally it's been recommended that you put a couple of drops of either just sterile saline, or you can put some topical anesthetic drops on the strip itself. And then you pull down the eyelid and touch the, the moistened strip to the sclera and then have the patient blink. This can be pretty challenging in pediatric patients. And I, I think that the reason people like the drops before was that they're a little easier to get in. You just kind of get them in the right direction. I like to put it in the medial canthus with the patient's head back a little bit and they blink and then that kind of makes the solution go in there. And a way that you can kind of get around that or a way that we suggest in the article and, and we use commonly in the emergency department is you take a, a sterile saline flush, you eject all but about a milliliter of, of the saline solution, and then you put the sterile strip into that and it makes a little solution for you. It works really well. And what that stain does, the fluorescein itself, is it it stains the basement membrane below the epithelium. So you can see if there's any epithelial defects. And that's usually what we're looking for. So there's a number of things that we look for with that. But it can also help us know if there's a more subtle perforation of the globe or, or something like that. But that should be done on most patients with an eye injury just to make sure that there's not something that you're missing, especially globe rupture. I think that you should avoid it if there's an obvious globe rupture. 
but otherwise fluorescein should be part of your standard exam and diagnostics. It's cheap, it's fast, it's easy. If they do have a globe rupture and you're going to pick it up on fluorescein staining, what kinds of things would we be seeing? Yeah, so if there is a globe rupture, what we look for is something called Seidel sign. So if there is a, a perforation into the globe itself, what happens is the vitreous, it lights up with the fluorescein, and then you also get an epithelial defect, obviously, from the perforation that lights up. The vitreous, as it kind of flows down, it causes this waterfall-like effect. It's very distinct. It's, it's usually pretty obvious to see. So that's something that everybody should be familiar with when they're doing a fluorescein stain. We also look for something called an ice ring sign, and there's a good picture of that in the article. What that can tell you is that you have this continue with scratching of the epithelium. And what that can be caused by is a embedded foreign body in the sclera of the eyelid that needs to be removed. And you wouldn't have known otherwise without the fluorescein. Good. So the, the next thing that I, I think is really important to check is pH. This is mostly if you're worried about a, an ocular burn from either chemicals or thermal burn. Most of the time, if somebody got poked with a finger in the eye, you probably don't need to do a pH. But if you are worried about an ocular burn, it's really important to know, is this a, a more alkaline or, or acidic thing that, that we're dealing with here? And then if the pH is above 7.7 or below 7.3, that, that means you, you really need to try and get that pH normalized because there can be serious injury to the corneal epithelium from these chemicals. If you don't have pH paper in your emergency department, which does happen often, uh, an easy way that we use if we're out of pH paper is uh, you can take a point of care urinalysis dipstick and touch the pH portion of that to the patient's sclera and get an accurate reading of what the pH is. It's a good way to do it in a pinch. I will add that if the pH is below 6.5, that's a big red flag that you need to do more aggressive irrigation. Good. So that's a good point. We have two sets of numbers in the article. We've got the normal pH for the eye, which is 7.3 to 7.7. .7. And then depending on the chemical exposure, you're going to get some kind of pH derangement. If it's less than 6.5, that's a pretty severely acidic exposure. And if it's over 7.7, .7, that's your alkaline exposure. Either of those extremes is an indication for some seriously aggressive eye irrigation. So those are good numbers to keep in mind when you're testing pH. So we've talked about fluorescein staining and pH. What should be next when it comes to our examination? Another common physical exam slash diagnostic tool is ocular pressure sonometry. I think this is valuable and it should be used when appropriate. In children, younger children especially, it can be very difficult to, to perform. And it's something that, that you may just have to forego entirely in younger children. If the child is older and cooperative, you can do it safely. If you do suspect that there is an open globe, you should um, not perform ocular tonometry unless otherwise directed by an ophthalmologist. The only thing I'll add is that a lot of times you don't have the tonometer easily available. And unless, I mean, if you suspect ruptured globe, you just stop the exam and let the ophthalmologist take over. But in other cases, a quick way is to just do eye ballotment with your fingers. So first, what I do is just gently feel like, how does the globe feel of the normal eye? And then compare it to what I would feel in the affected eye. So the pressure should feel the same. Mostly, clinically, what's relevant is loss of pressure, especially in case of ocular trauma. So if you feel like, oh, this globe has really less pressure as compared to the other one, that would be an important clinical tool for their testing or determination. Now, I'm imagining some people listening to this and then poking children in the eye with their finger. <laughs> Tell me when no. you do, when you're testing this with your finger, are you doing this? They've got their eyelids closed and you're feeling it through the eyelid or are you uh, touching it laterally, like near the lateral canthus on the sclera or where are you putting your finger in this scenario? Yeah, so clearly we have the eyelids closed because any normal human being, if you have your eyelid open and people coming with both their fingers to the eyes does not seem like a good feeling. And the natural response will be to shut your eyelids to protect your own eyes. So you want them 
to close their eyes and then gently on both the uh, medial and the lateral canthus, just sort of gently push the eyeball underneath and feel like what you feel. You can do this to your own eye too if you want to like play with it, but it's easy. It doesn't cause any pain or pressure. It's a very, very gentle touch that you're doing and just feeling like what you feel underneath the pressure, get a, get a subjective assessment and then feel it in the other eye too. Again, eyelids closed, two fingers, one at the medial canthus, other at the lat lateral canthus, and gently feel the eyeball pressure. Good. And again, if you suspect a globe injury, we're not doing this or the tonometry, not looking to increase any pressure at all on the eyeball if you think there's a globe injury. So yes, if there is an open globe, period, I think, there is no further discussion or debate. If you are suspecting an open globe injury, you stop your exam, put a styrofoam cup on, and then you're out of the room. Just get the ophthalmologist at that point and go from there. Good. So fluorescein staining, ocular pressure, pH testing. What else? I think we'll move on to imaging from there. Point of care ultrasound has become ubiquitous in emergency departments now, and it's becoming more important modality, especially within pediatrics. There is a lot of good research out these days supporting POCUS for ocular injuries specifically. With POCUS, you can assess the lens really well. You can see if it looks like it's dislocated. You can look at vitreous, see if there's any shape abnormalities of the eye itself. You can look at the optic nerve which is useful for a number of things. You can also look at the retrobulbar segments, and you can even see ONI abnormalities. I think where ultrasound really shines with ocular trauma is when a patient has a really swollen eye and you can't even pry the eyelids open to get a good exam, you can get some really good data there where when you put the ultrasound on, you can see if the patient has good extraocular movements, you can see if there's an afferent pupillary reflex. And I, I think that those two things are probably some of the most valuable things you have with a swollen eye. Good. So if I'm dealing with someone who's got significant swelling, edema, bruising, or even just refusing to open their eye, that ultrasound may be very, very helpful in assessing them. How is it that you're performing the ultrasound specifically? What are some of those tips or techniques that we should keep in mind, especially in children? We can't stress enough that you never want to put any extra pressure on these eyes and you probably shouldn't be doing ultrasound if you think that there's an open globe. But if you do feel it's appropriate, it's a very simple technique. If the patient's cooperative, there's no big cuts or anything on the eye, you just have them close their eye, you put a whole bunch of gel on the eye, and then you place the ultrasound over the eye itself using their forehead to steady your hand. And you never actually touch the eye. It just sits on that gel above and then you can assess from there. Sometimes if they're a younger child who you think might have a hard time keeping their eye closed, you can put a clear dressing such as a tegaderm over the eye and then put the gel over that. Either way, it's actually a very simple modality. Good. I do actually like the ultrasound specifically because I can also save images and I found it helpful to sometimes just send those to my ophthalmologist as I'm having the discussion, hey, here's what the ultrasound showed. In the few times I've done that, that's been a helpful tool as well. I would agree with that. I think it adds some legitimacy to your diagnosis when you're talking to the ophthalmologist. Coming to slit lamp, really, I'm not sure our ED does not have a slit lamp previous places where I worked, they did have a slit lamp in the ED. It is definitely useful even for a pediatric ophthalmologist to get a slit lamp exam, depending on their age group, can be very challenging. But for teenagers and kids over 10 years old who are more cooperative, it can be a useful diagnostic tool. So if you have it in your ER, it, it is a good tool to get used to the reason being that the light beam, it can slice the eyeball and the structures with a very high light intensity. So you can pick up more subtler parts of the exam that can be missed with the naked eye. So it is a good diagnostic tool and useful, but a lot of times in the emergency room, if you don't have it 
and if it's if the injuries are more subtle, that's a test that can be performed outpatient in the ophthalmologist office. Good. Yeah, and I think important to keep in mind that the slit lamps come in multiple varieties nowadays, the traditional rolling cart, but there are some handheld versions as well, making them more portable, perhaps easier to use in children. Yeah. So when it comes to CT imaging of ocular injuries, what kinds of suspected injuries would lead us to consider CT as a modality? Under what kind of circumstances might we go, oh, a CT would be useful in this scenario? So as much as we don't want to irradiate the kids, in cases of ocular trauma, CT scan can be a very useful diagnostic tool, especially if you're suspecting open globe, I would get a CT scan of the orbits at that point. I think any time that you are concerned about an open globe, a foreign body that, that may be in the eye, orbital fracture or a retrovulvar hematoma, a thin slice orbital CT is your gold standard. That's the most important image you could probably get. Unfortunately, when we're talking about foreign bodies within the eye, it's only going to pick up things that are radio opaque, like metal or, or stone. If the child was poked in the eye with a stick or, or wood or some other vegetable matter, you wouldn't be able to see anything. And that's probably the only time that I would end up getting an MRI is to see if there was some sort of vegetable matter in there. Okay, so a couple of more questions. When we are considering MRI imaging, are you screening for metallic foreign bodies first and then sending them to MRI? And if you are, are you doing that screening with a CT or just plain films? How do you approach that? If you're worried about a metallic foreign body or any foreign body because CT is going to be your gold standard anyways, that should be performed before you're ever going towards the MRI because the MRI is absolutely contraindicated if there's a metal form body in the eye. So point of care ultrasound, then CT imaging, non-contrast, thin slice through the orbits, looking for globe injuries, orbital injuries, hematomas, foreign bodies. And then if you still suspect that there might be a foreign body there that's non-metallic and you don't see anything on CT, then perhaps MRI in that scenario. Does that sound right? Correct. Excellent. All right, let's move on to treatment. So if we have made the diagnosis and we're now entertaining some treatment options, let's start with some of the more difficult ones. How about lid lacerations? There's always a controversy about who it is that's supposed to repair these and when. Tell me what we need to know about lacerations to the eyelids. So there are very clear indications of when the ER physician can repair versus an ophthalmologist. Basically, if it is superficial and does not involve the lead margins, an ER physician can attempt to repair it. Again, you have to remember that depending on the developmental stage of the child and your experience as a pediatric ER physician, you are going towards this kid with a needle very, very close to the eyeball. So the goal would be to prevent iatrogenic globe rupture, basically. So consider sedation if you need to. And then less is more, a lot of these lacerations that are minor, mostly like an aberration, nature can take care of it itself. You don't need to be very aggressive. Absolute indication for an ophthalmologist to come in is lid margin lacerations. If it's a complex like dog bite or animal bite that involves the canalicular system, they need to check the patency of the nasolacrimal duct and the lacrimal canalicular system so that if there is any tarsal plate involvement, so any lacerations that are deeper and have gone up to the tarsal plate, so anything that is more than superficial should be done possibly under sedation by an ophthalmologist. One other caveat, anytime you even have a minor lid laceration, I would encourage people to feel their own eyelids. There is not a lot there. It's a very thin structure and what the literature review showed that a lot of times with eyelid lacerations, even if they're a little bit more deep, you have underlying scleral injury and an open globe injury is missed because people are not looking for it and that scleral injury is further behind so it may be hard for you 
to just pick it up during your ED assessment. When we talk about who should be repairing these, there are, I think, some institutions that go back and forth between ophthalmology or plastic surgery or even oculoplastics in some areas. So could it be based on what your local practice pattern is and what your ophthalmologist recommends that perhaps it's a plastic surgeon who's repairing these or an oculoplastics person as opposed to just your routine ophthalmologist? Yes, I mean, that can clearly be based on local practice, but it would be in my mind an ED physician versus a surgeon. That's how I would think about it. And what's our timeline for repair for these kinds of injuries? Do they have to be performed within just a few hours of arrival? Well, usually 12 to 24 hours is okay. Like within 24 hours, it's not, it doesn't need like immediate repair. All right. What about orbital fractures? What kinds of things should we be looking for, especially in children? And what about repair timeline for these injuries? I'd say kids come in all the time with periorbital swelling from a variety of mechanisms. And uh, you should be thinking about orbit fractures in a lot of these. Anytime you have the, the eyelids are really swollen, there's facial asymmetry, any conjunctival hemorrhage or significant chemosis of the eye, pain with extraocular movement, an ophthalmos or exophthalmos, it, significant tenderness when you're pressing on the orbit itself, crepitus. We're also looking for decreased dermatomal sensation around the eye or double vision. Any of those things should really tip you off that you should be thinking about an orbital fracture and get a CT to rule that out. The problem with orbital fractures is they can cause a, a variety of complications. One of the, the issues with pediatrics versus adult patients is that there's still a lot of skeletal immaturity and they're more prone to certain types of blowout fractures. And where they get hit on one side of the orbit and that causes like a superior orbital fracture as well, or other like surrounding orbital fracture. And that can cause nerve entrapment or muscle entrapment, or even worse, you can get an ocular compartment syndrome with a retro vulvar hematoma. And ultimately we're not going to be doing much for most of these things beyond getting ophthalmology involved emergently. So there are two things I will add to this. This is like my favorite ocular trauma part is orbital fractures. I love them. I don't know why. But two things that, yes, I agree with CT and every assessment, the signs and symptoms that Dr. Walker suggested. It is on page 10 of our article. The most important part for you to determine during your clinical exam is your entrapment or not. Entrapment is not a CT diagnosis. A lot of people misunderstand, oh, I'm getting a CT. It will tell me if there is entrapment or not, because there are two parts to the entrapment. You can have muscle entrapment and fat entrapment. I mean, a CT can tell you, but it is a clinical diagnosis. So make sure you do the six cardinal eye movements for both the eyes and C. Because on a neutral gaze, you might feel that there is no entrapment. But when you do the six cardinal eye movements, is when you will figure out entrapment. The other important part, although it is very rare, is oculocardiac reflex. So you can have entrapment of the branch of the vagus nerve and you can be bradycardic. These are the kids who will not respond to epinephrine. There are a few case reports of them coding because of entrapment. So if you notice that a child with or orbital fracture has muscle entrapment and is bradycardic, you may want the ophthalmologist in your ER stat because if this kid starts coding, epinephrine may not work. Yeah. Uh, you just have to release the muscle. That is the treatment to stop this kid from coding. Wow, that sounds like a dreadful complication. I hope I never... It's rare, it. fortunately, <laughs> but it's reported. <laughs> okay, so extraocular movements, very important, making sure that there's no entrapment, or at least if there is, making sure you diagnose the entrapment. So for orbital fractures, I will clarify that if it is an orbital blowout fracture without entrapment, up to two weeks is acceptable before surgical intervention. But if there is a muscle entrapment, you need a much more urgent repair within hours to prevent the muscle ischemia. And that should be mm. discussed with your ophthalmologist if you're suspecting entrapment. But that certainly cannot wait days or weeks. 
Good. So that makes the exam even more important in that scenario, because if there's not entrapment, the consultant may just say, I'll see them in the clinic next week, and that's actually okay. Mm -hmm. But if there is entrapment, that changes the algorithm there and the timeline for repair. That's good to know. Yes, thank you. All right, let's move on to corneal abrasions then. We've made the diagnosis. Anything specific to children as far as treatment is concerned? I think corneal abrasions are, are pretty common with pediatric patients. They tend to stick things in their eye more often, it, it feels like. I think the important things are probably about the same as with adults. Like you want to take contact lenses out if they have them in and keep them out until the cornea is healed. You're still going to be using topical antibiotics like you do with adults. So that's usually erythromycin ointments. And the reason we use the ointment over the drops is that it adds kind of a lubricating effect too, which tends to help with the healing. It's important. And maybe with children, you might have more like fingernail lacerations or vegetable matter abrasions from getting a stick in the eye or again with contact Lens wearers, you should be thinking about fluoroquinolones to cover for uh, pseudomonas. NSAIDs are our mainstay for pain. We don't recommend covering the eye anymore. That used to be a pretty common recommendation. Topical anesthetics, they can be used in the emergency departments. There's been some really good studies, mostly in adults, that suggest that topical anesthetics are safe to use outpatient for up to 24 hours. We still don't recommend sending people home in this article um, or in general with topical anesthetics because if they use them for greater than 24 hours, there has been some association with corneal damage and it's hard to make sure that a family is, is going to stop after that 24 hours. Yeah, that's a good point is making sure that they're adherent to the instructions can be rather difficult if there's a screaming child involved and a couple of drops makes the child stop screaming, <laughs> especially at home or in the middle of the night. Sometimes that can tempt a parent or a guardian to continue using that medication longer than they should, and that's really when we start running into trouble. The article does make mention of topical NSAIDs. Really, any role for that in this scenario? So there, there have been some studies that show that topical NSAIDs are just as effective as oral NSAIDs. They're, they're cheap. They're not easily available to everyone, though. And it's most people already have some Tylenol or some ibuprofen at home. So you can do them. It's OK, but it might just be easier to do the oral stuff. Good. OK, so we've done corneal abrasions. But what if on our examination we see a corneal foreign body? How are we supposed to deal with that in our child? patient? Most corneal foreign bodies are very superficial, so only require very simple treatment. And that can either be irrigating the eye to try and get the foreign body out. You can use a moistened cotton swab to try and get it out. If that doesn't work, or if the foreign body is embedded in that epithelial layer, and I, I should note here that there are Foreign bodies that may be just embedded in the epithelial layer, and that's pretty mild. That's something that we can take care of on our own. But any foreign body that goes below that into any other layer within the eye or especially penetrating, that's something that you need to call an ophthalmologist about. So for these superficial ones in that epithelial layer, if you can get it out with flushing or with that cotton swab, you can use on the cooperative patient, probably older patients, <laughs> You can use the beveled edge of a 25 or like a 27 gauge needle to try and loosen that foreign body. And then you can flush it out after that. Obviously, that's going to depend on the provider or the caretaker's comfort level and their skill set. But it is something that, that most people should be able to do. I think that just like corneal abrasions, we're still doing topical anesthetics. They're going to help a lot, both with the discomfort and with the healing. What if on your examination, you see a metallic foreign body, maybe you're even able to remove it, but there's a rust ring on the cornea. Anything specific we have to do about that? So rust rings themselves are more just indicative of what type of foreign body you're dealing with. And they can, you get the rust within a few hours to days after uh, metal is, is stuck or embedded in the epithelium there. We don't do anything different. We just take that out the same way that we would with any other foreign body, but it's something notable on exam. 
I would have them follow up with an ophthalmologist depending on where it is, just because it may affect your field of vision. I mean, if it's more peripheral, it really doesn't matter and it may be more cosmetic. But if it is within the central range of your vision, then just imagine seeing a ring in between of whatever else you're seeing in your visual field. So either ways, I don't think it's a bad idea for outpatient off to follow up in that case. And any foreign body that you can't get out, you should have an ophthalmologist remove it outpatient, but it's important that it happens within 24 hours. Okay. So that's corneal foreign bodies. And now if we're talking about patients who've been exposed to chemicals and we're going to begin irrigation, what kinds of things should we keep in mind for these injuries? I think the uh, most important thing with any chemical injury to the eye is the importance of irrigating fast, irrigating as soon as possible. That's the most important thing. What we use for irrigation doesn't seem to be as important as how fast we start the irrigation and how much we use. For our, our friends who are doing pre-hospital care or in any other situation, if all you have is tap water, that's fine. You can use that. Lactated ringers and normal saline are also appropriate. Some places not within the United States, have some buffered solutions that you can use, which are supposed to be very effective, but again, not really available here at this time. So lots of irrigation is the key here. Take a pH, just like we discussed before, for any pH you know above 7.7, .7, those alkaline things, you need to be aggressively irrigating. Anything below 7.3, and you really need to start worrying after it's below 6.5, you got to aggressively irrigate as well. A really important thing to keep in mind, after you've irrigated, you should wait probably about 30 minutes at least before you recheck a pH. Your pH can be falsely elevated or decreased from your irrigation solution. So you need to wait for that to kind of normalize to see what the actual pH of the eye is. It can be tricky to irrigate little kids. Obviously, there are a number of ways that we irrigate the eyes. You can do direct irrigation where you just take a bag of normal saline or lactated ringers, you cut off the end, you keep their eye open, and you dump a bunch of fluid in there. Another option is you can use a Morgan lens, which is kind of like a contact lens with, a, with tubing on it that you can put directly on the eye and irrigate through that. That's not always well tolerated with children, even with teenagers, so that's something you'll have to play out. With, with an individual patient. Another popular thing is using uh, nasal cannulae, where you can put those, where the nasal cannulae are sitting on either side of the eyes, kind of at the medial canthus of both eyes, and you can run the fluid through there with the head tilted at an angle so it runs over the eye. If the patient is cooperative, it's really helpful for them to move their eye around while this is happening. It can be tricky to get them to do that, but that's also supposed to help with the washing process. Good. And the article makes specific reference of volumes, so two liters or 30 minutes of irrigation if it's a mild exposure, but even up to 10 liters or two to four hours of irrigation if it's a severe case and there's some severe pH derangement. Is that right? That's correct. And it's not uncommon, especially with really alkaline injuries, that these kids need to be admitted for continuing irrigation and continuing checks of the pH. Ophthalmology should always be consulted with these ocular burns, especially when the pH is, again, above 7.7 .7 or below 6.5. And then they can continue directing how much irrigation should be given. Good. Now that deals with the chemical burns, but there is also the potential for thermal burns to the eye. What treatment is available in those scenarios and, and how are we having that discussion with our ophthalmology colleagues as far as classification of these goes? So thermal burns are similar to chemical burns in terms of how much damage we're looking at on the eye. Thermal burns tend to have a little more obvious damage that you can see. And they use something called the Roper Paul classification system, which can be used for either, but it's a little easier to use with thermal burns. And that's based on how much of the cornea is involved on exam and how much of the conjunctival limbus is involved. 
So there's a chart on page 13, table nine, which it would be really helpful when you're discussing this with your ophthalmologist, what percentage of the cornea and conjunctiva is involved. Good. And treatment there is kind of guided by our ophthalmology colleagues, but there's a lot of topical gels involved, like the typical ointments as well. Yeah, it's just like with corneal abrasions, we still use the topical antibiotics. Sometimes under the direction of ophthalmology, they'll use corticosteroid drops, but we, as a rule, never use topical corticosteroids without ophthalmology giving us the go ahead. All right, let's move on to hyphema. So when we see somebody with a traumatic hyphema, what kinds of treatment modalities do we have at our disposal and what kind of disposition does that patient need? So hyphema, again, make sure you get good with your exam, especially with darker irises. I see residents and fellows and a lot of people say, oh, I couldn't appreciate an hyphema because the iris is dark. You want to look at it at an angle and you should be able to pick up hyphema regardless of the iris color of the patient. Obviously, this means that there is bleeding in the anterior chamber. And depending, if you look at page 14, depending on the grade of the hyphema, further treatment is based on that. Just to remember it crudely, I remember it as one third, one third, one third. If it is less than one third, most of those patients can go home. The treatment obviously varies depending on the underlying condition. This is where your hemoglobinopathies and sickle cell trait comes into play. So if you have sickle cell trait, then the risk of re-bleeding in the next 24 to 48 hours is pretty high. And those are the kids who will have more conservative management. If not, one-third hyphema can go home with an outpatient ophthalmology follow-up. It is important that they keep themselves elevated in the bed at 45 degree angle, even while they're in the ER, you don't want to have them lay flat. You want them elevated at 45 degrees because there may be more collecting blood or debris or something which you want it to collect at the bottom. Grade two, three, and four, again, you have to discuss with the ophthalmologist if you want to do outpatient versus admit them. It's not uncommon for those kids to get admitted because it's hard for a parent, depending on the developmental milestone, to have the kid be in a certain position, get eye drops and whatever is required for the child as a part of the treatment. If you have grade 3 and grade 4 hyphema, also think about a ruptured globe. There's a very high chance of a ruptured globe associated with it, which you might just be focusing on the hyphema and completely miss that. So grade one and about, definitely you want to work closely with the ophthalmologist. Either ways, they need outpatient follow-up. The thing about hyphema is that if it doesn't resolve and it can cause corneal staining, it is not as important in an ER perspective, the treatment, but more from a quality of life and morbidity perspective long-term, that if you have corneal staining, it will affect their field of vis vision, especially if you have hyphema more than grade one. And so if they have sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, hemophilia, or really any kind of hemoglobinopathy, they're at increased risk for re-bleeding and making this injury worse. Are those patients then admitted to the hospital or do they just need more close follow-up as an outpatient if they've got the most minor, say the grade one type of hyphema? Yes. So for grade one, an outpatient follow-up would not be unreasonable. But again, you have to look at multiple factors, especially in pediatrics. Like, does the parent have all the resources to take care of this child? What is the developmental milestone and how the child is going to be? And what are your ophthalmology resources? Like, are they reliable? Is the follow-up going to be reliable? If all that is a check yes, and if things are all lined up well within the system, they can certainly follow outpatient. All right. And then traumatic iritis. When we're making this diagnosis, what kinds of things do we need to keep in mind as far as treatment goes and disposition? So in terms of treatment, 
really it is more outpatient and you can talk to your ophthalmologist about that. The thing with traumatic iditis, it's maybe difficult to diagnose without a slit lamp. It's easier when you see that flare response on a slit lamp. Most cases in pediatrics, if they are complaining of blurry vision and you have done a really thorough exam and you don't see see anything, my clinical impression would be most likely traumatic iritis because there are cells in the anterior chamber that are making your vision blurry. And you can get some prescription like cycloplegics or even topical corticosteroids all in discussion with the ophthalmologist. This isolated traumatic iritis can certainly follow outpatient. And it is a self-limited condition which should heal in about two weeks and they should have normal vision back by then. Good. Now, we touched a lot on open globe injuries already, but anything that we haven't covered when it comes to open globe injuries and treatment in the ED? I think it's just a lot of the same. Just don't add any pressure. Kids can be a little tricky. It's uncomfortable for them to have this kind of eye pain. Try and get it under control. Get child life involved if you have them available at your hospital. Use oral intranasal meds to, to get that IV in if you need to. Use antiemetics to try and keep them from throwing up. And just use everything in your quiver of skills to try and keep them comfortable. That's it. What about antibiotics in these cases? So if we go to the clinical pathway, then we have yes to your IV antibiotics. So it says stop the exam, give a rigid eye shield like a styrofoam cup. I I just love that. It's just easy as compared to some of the metal things you worry that will cause more injury from that. You want to obtain a CT scan. You want to give tetanus prophylaxis, give IV antibiotics, and consult your ophthalmology friend. And there's a a great picture there, figure 11, of a teardrop pupil. That's a physical exam finding that should lead us to assume there's an open globe injury until proven otherwise. Is that right? Yes. All right. Lastly is the retrobulbar hemorrhage. So if we've obtained the CT scan and we see this hemorrhage behind the globe, what kinds of treatment options are available to us and what things do we have to keep in mind? So this is one of those emergent things that you need to get working on right away. You can get that ocular compartment syndrome from this, which cuts off blood supply to the eye and can cause rapid loss of vision, permanent loss of vision. So the definitive treatment for retrobulbar hematoma is the lateral canthotomy. This is one of those things that makes people squirm when they think about cutting in right next to somebody's eye. Um, doesn't make anyone comfortable. If you are lucky enough to have an ophthalmologist nearby, it's not inappropriate to try and get them in there to do it immediately within an hour. But if you are like many places where you, you don't have that luxury, this is something that both emergency medicine physicians, pediatric emergency medicine physicians, should be comfortable with doing emergently. And the procedure itself, although it does make us uncomfortable to think about, it's it's relatively simple. And the, the article itself gives you a quick rundown. And there's a really good video that we also posted or put a link to that's a, a good review for all of us to be ready if we have to do it. Yes. I say nerve wracking indeed, but in these scenarios, critically necessary. So the link is there in the article. We'll include it in the podcast show notes. That's from first10em.com, their lateral canthotomy procedure. And I find it to be very helpful. It's an excellent review of how to conduct that procedure. There are also great pictures there of pupil abnormalities. So the teardrop pupil, irregularly shaped pupils, peripheral iris injuries, all of these things that might indicate globe injuries. If you have access to the article, again, I highly recommend you take a look at some of those pictures. I find them to be very, very helpful. We did touch on some special populations like the children with sickle trait when it comes to hyphemas. What about our hemophiliac children or those with von Willebrand's disease? Is it just a concern if they have a hyphema? What about with the other ocular injuries? Anything specific to that? Well, mostly with hyphema, but like obviously they are at increased risk of bleeding. So if they have 
any hematomas or contusions and things like that, I would talk to their hematologist and see if they need the factor or not. But any any injury, even blunt trauma, that can increase the risk of bleeding. The bleeding can be more severe in those cases. So I would direct the treatment for factor replacement in conjunction with their primary hematological provider. And then how about the kind of extremely young patients, our neonates and infants, anything specific we have to keep in mind for them? I would say non-accidental trauma. If you have like minor like corneal abrasions and things like that, that's okay. The article does touch on like cover uncovered test and red reflex and things like that, which is not very specific for ocular trauma. However, this is the age group where if you're seeing them, you might be the first doctor doing their eye exam and you might pick up a retinoblastoma or some other major ophthalmological condition that needs further care. So I would take a peek at that. But also remember, if there's a major injury per se, just think about non-accidental trauma. All right. And then the last one was patients who use contact lenses. Contact lenses just puts you at an overall increased risk for infection. Mostly what we worry about is gram-negative bacteria, which includes pseudomonas. So anyone with ocular trauma, you should get those contact lenses out. If you're giving them antibiotics for an abrasion or another concern, consider broadening that treatment to cover for pseudomonas. And then people who are wearing contact lenses should keep them off until either They've seen an ophthalmologist who recommends it's time to put them back on or until their symptoms have completely resolved. And what one of my ophthalmology colleagues said is that don't throw away the solution and the contact lenses. If they have some resistant infection, they can run a microbiological mm -hmm. studies on the contact lens itself and the solution to guide the treatment. So I always ask them to keep it and take it to your ophthalm appointment. Oh, interesting. That's a, that's a new suggestion I hadn't heard before. I like that. Okay, let's talk about some of the controversies then. This is the last section of the article. One of them was about ketamine for sedation, which is something we use in pediatrics a lot. Is there any concern with increasing intraocular pressure when we're considering using ketamine to sedate a child with a trauma to the eye? So in answer to that, no, there's no concern about causing an increase in intraocular pressure from the ketamine itself. So it's safe to use. We have some good data and animal studies that have shown that there's no increase. Our biggest problem right now is there's a national shortage of ketamine, so <laughs> we won't have to worry about that anyways. All right. Good to keep in mind that that's not an issue. And then tetanus prophylaxis, is that routine for anyone who's got an eye injury? I think this is a uh, commonplace in the emergency department anyway. Anytime there's a, a, a cut or a scrape, if there's a penetrating eye injury, it's good to check their tetanus status and, and uh, update them accordingly. Yeah, especially for open globe. I mean, I would just give it at that point. All right. Let's talk about visual acuity apps. So we were talking earlier about the charts to use in pediatrics and whether or not we have access to anything other than the standard Snellen chart. Is it okay to use our portable devices and the visual acuity apps and select those charts instead? So this is a topic that I, I think is really interesting because there are a number of studies that have come out showing how effective the visual acuity apps can be on phones. Problem is you got to make sure you have the right app. There are a number that have these floating E's where it's just an E and it is pointed in different directions. And actually... It's really easy to use with little kids, little kids that don't even know their letters. They can just point which direction they see this thing pointing. So it's very effective. You just have to use it appropriately. I've seen other apps that have not been well studied, including Snellen charts on people's phones, that it's too hard to get the right distance and to use it appropriately. So I do suggest try and find one of these floating e apps. I use one called Peak Acuity but I think that's only available on Android. It makes your job a little easier. Yeah, I'm a technology geek and I love all things electronics. So if there's an app for it out there, I'm all for it. So look for something that comes with instructions. Make sure you follow the instructions and then perhaps consider one of these floating E diagrams instead of your typical eye chart. That's helpful information. 
Well, we're at the end. I want to say thank you to both of you for taking the time both to do all of the research and author the article, but also to be on the podcast today to kind of walk us through all of it. It's a terrifying topic for most of us and something we don't really love to do. And it's certainly more challenging in the pediatric population. But I think with this in your back pocket, you are well suited to have an excellent conversation with your ophthalmologist and come up with a good disposition plan. The article is jam-packed full of figures and tables and lots of references. And if you have access to the mobile app, all of that is in your pocket. So thank you to both of you again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. It was fun. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Wow. That was an amazing summary of all things ocular trauma in children. Thank you again to Dr. Shaw and Dr. Walker, and thank you for being a listener. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate us in whatever podcast store you listen. And don't forget, for the rest of November, 20% off anything that you buy at ebmedicine.net when you spend $300 or more. That's three journals, the mobile app, all the references. It's an amazing volume of information and a great reference for your clinical practice. All you have to do is use the thankful 20 promo code and there's all the details about it at ebmedicine.net. Until next time, everyone, be safe and have a great Thanksgiving.